At first sight, this looks like a normal Mercedes S-Class being parked here at the parking lane in Santa Monica. Oh, did we pay for the parking? We better keep going <laughs> pretty quickly. Well, this one here is a level 3 autonomous S-Class. It means it can drive itself, but under which conditions and when? We're going to find out here with Thomas and Autogefühl. And how special is this one here? What extra equipment do you need? Let's find out. So when you order Mercedes S-Class, you have to buy this optional feature like an you know, expensive sound system for about four or five thousand euros or dollars. And then already some features on the outside are visible. For example here, well on the left side you get the normal camera, you know. And then to basically mirror that also visually wise, there is this element on the right side. And here behind there's the LiDAR sensor. So it's a laser sensor that you need then for the autonomous, autonomous driving. At least that's the Mercedes philosophy. You know Tesla always goes everything with camera. Mercedes says we need that LiDAR. And here we have a hidden microphone that is actually detecting rain. And that's actually hidden here inside the wheel arch and well what is that for actually? So at this moment they don't want to allow the autonomous driving function while raining and so the microphone just says ah, are there any like water drop sounds and then the system shuts off. Of course this will be changed in, you know, in future long-term perspective but at this moment this is how it is. It's funny right? And then here at the rear we have this bump. This would look really interesting, right? And this is an additional GPS unit to be even more precise than to know where the car is exactly. And then an additional camera at the rear. And this camera there is mainly focusing on emergency vehicles or police coming from the rear that you can also make way for them. On the interior everything looks kind of similar. However, Look at that. These are the special buttons then inside of the steering wheel up there. It looks a little bit weird, but I think you get used to it. So you need to activate these then while driving. Well, let's try it out. Now we're driving the Mercedes S-Class with the level three autonomous driving features. We're joined by Lucas Bolster. He is a development engineer for the self-driving functions here at Mercedes. And we have picked here the US highways today because this one will probably be one of the major use cases what is this car capable of at this moment, at this stage? What can it do? Yeah, so when you're on a, a drive pilot ready road, the system will offer you drive pilot availability on the steering wheel. And then once engaged, we'll take over the driving task and allow you to engage in secondary activities, watching a movie, emailing, things like this. So when is it actually ready or how does the car know which road is suitable for that? Which are the parameters that need to be met? So the car has a high definition map of all of the roads that we've selected um, and then it looks for other conditions to be met. So for example you're driving under 40 miles per hour, um, you have detectable lane markings, a barrier and car ahead of you. Once those are true you get these activation lights Yep. also in the instrument cluster, yep. and then you can enable the system with the dedicated button. So left or right? Left or right. Now the system is active, and you could take your hands off the steering wheel. Uh, you know, you can play Tetris, the games in the head unit. Why don't you do it? <laughs> we could, yeah, we can. Don't you fancy playing Tetris? I mean. You want Tetris? We, could, we can play a movie. I usually uh, play Tetris when I load the trunk, you know, it's like... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to watch about your Mercedes, but you could. Oh, there's the... <laughs> you have it at the moment restricted to 60 kilometers an hour or 40 miles per hour. Yes. Why is that? I mean, in Germany, that's kind of like the law limit. Yeah. But here in California, you could actually already go like unlimited speed. That would be possible, right? Not for the system. The system was designed together for both markets. Um, and the idea, you know, basically we, we defined the 40 miles per hour, the 60 kilometers per hour for traffic jam speeds, where we're comfortable with doing safe driving. Let, let's say you can drive faster, but at this moment you say that's not safe yet, or how, how, how does it Yeah, it, it needs to be validated, right? Okay. At every step we continue to kind of go further and further and this is the first step for us with level 3 until 40 miles per hour. And at this moment you can also, um, uh, for example, take out your smartphone, do some emails and stuff. Um, this depends on the, the local law where the system is operating. Is it allowed here? Could you? It's not allowed in it's California. It's not allowed? You can, no. Oh, interesting. But 
reading newspaper, is that allowed? Only on the head unit. Oh, okay, so nothing, like, are you allowed to eat a banana? I think so. <laughs> the car's accelerating now on its own. What would happen if, like, the traffic jam is, like, you know, is gone? Would it say, like, hey, come on, Lucas? Exactly. Drive yourself, or? So when the, the leading car gets too far away, yeah. the system will ask me to take over control. Ah. Uh, oh, no, it says take control. Yeah, they're too far it's... away. Ah, okay. My belt gets... Tightened, yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And now you are instructed yeah. why. But in, as far as I know, in Germany, the law is that you can use your smartphone, right? In the level three autonomous. Yes. Yeah, you, you can, you can, yeah. That's interesting, right? So, um, usually Germany is stricter with everything, <laughs> right? We are the land of everyone is strict with everything. But in this case, some things are stricter in the US. That's, that's very interesting, right? Um, so, we already have other, you know, market players in that field. So, you know, Tesla has been doing the thing for quite a long time, but most of the time people mistake it because it's still level two and you're still self-responsible for that but here the thing is when the car is in that level three mode you are also taking the liability for that yeah the car is the driver it's doing the dynamic driving task and your job is just to remain ready to respond to its requests for you to continue driving so when you are in the level three mode and there's an accident you pay. I, I think it would need to be investigated. You personal. I, you I <laughs> personally. Contact me, yeah. <laughs> Lucas is paying nope. for all the accidents you might ever uh, have in the level 3 autonomous Mercedes S-Class or EQS will be also available in the EQS. Okay, we got that one on. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing was we were talking to their CDO this morning and he actually said there is no special insurance fund or something for that. And you might think about, like, why is there none of that? Yeah, obviously, you don't expect many accidents to happen, right? No. <laughs> Do you expect zero accidents? No. <laughs> I, I, uh, the goal accidents is right to, yeah. to prevent accidents that are the fault of our driver. Yeah. But we're driving on a, a road in I-10 in Santa Monica. I see an accident here, right, at least... Once a, once a day, once a week, yeah, and it's fully possible that we would be also hit. Yeah, yeah, I see. Um, you do have extra equipment here. We shown it earlier, uh, and others say, ah, you know, what the hell? I don't need lidar. Hashtag Elon Musk. <laughs> Why would you say, nah, we need the lidar? I think the the big step from level two to level three is about having sufficient redundancy that the system never just turns off. So, right, it's important to us we get an extra set of lane information. So we get lane information from the stereo camera, from the parking cameras, and from the LiDAR. And then we also get objects from it. And it's robust against things that the camera and the radar are not robust against, right? So intense glare, uh, it's really good at detecting small or, or low unclassifiable objects. So if you think about the things you'd see on a, a LA road, like a couch or a dining room chair, uh, the LiDAR is really good at saying, you know, there's a, a light reflection back to my LiDAR. From this, there's an object there. Uh, like from engineering perspective, there must have been some obstacles why, I mean, we haven't seen this one here like 10 years ago. So yeah. what were like the main obstacles and how could you overcome them? Sure, so I think you know one of the big things was having a commercially available LiDAR. So we have a, a third sensor. Uh, also having a, a redundant chassis was a, a big step for us. So we have basically redundant brake and steering actuators in case there's a failure, the car can continue to safely drive. Um, and, and these weren't really possible 10 years ago. Uh, I think for us, it was kind of the natural step after basically having several years of level two systems available, um, taking what we learned there to make it that the car can actually take over the driving task. And, you know, there's also like the, you know, the, like this other market safe, uh, segment of 
level 4 self-driving vehicles, Waymo, Uber, they basically fit the vehicles for that purpose. They also do this pre-mapping. Um, what is then like the, the main difference? So why can't you say like, hey, give me a level 4 S-Class right now. Why is it not possible? Well, I think you know, this system was designed to go into cars sold and leased to customers. So the cost of the overall system is important to keep in mind. Um, but also the, the next step of, of needing to be able to drive through more situations when you're in level four. So in level three, we, for example, with the police officer behind us, right, that's a situation that we can't maybe totally handle, right? We can stop and, and for sure, but we can't communicate with them. We can't tell them, here's our insurance information. Uh, here's the registration paperwork of the vehicle. Um, and these are something that we would need to handle if we didn't want to have a driver in the car. But you already are working together with law enforcement. Correct. Right? So what are you maybe like giving them trainings and tell them like what to do in, in situations where the car drives itself? It, uh, yeah, so it's a, a two-way street. We're learning from them what they expect from the car and, and we're also sharing with them how to interact with our cars. But is that actually relevant for now already or is it more something that is only relevant when it's level four than when it's like driving really like driverless? I think at least here, right, it's, it's not legal, for example, to watch a movie uh, in a level two car, right? Yeah. But if you're a, a California Highway Patrol coming up the lane and you see me watching yeah. Auto Gafool, <laughs> then he's learning quickly. maybe he would, <laughs> he would think, oh, he's breaking the law. Uh, right, okay. and so we're telling, okay, if the, the turquoise lights are on, mm. he's allowed to do that. Interesting. What is actually then to come? This is now like the first step. What's the next step? I think the next step is about expanding where the feature is offered and what preconditions are around the feature. So, right, for example, it's only available above four degrees Celsius, not with a wet road or with heavy rain. Yeah, we or at night time. saw the rain sensor earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's right, it's about making these preconditions less and less restrictive. And once again, I, I know the, the comments are, are coming when you compare it to the competitors and they still say, and there's, you know, there's a point in that, like why are you, you know, in relation late in comparison to other, you know, autonomous driving systems? Is it a German thing? Is it a more conservative approach? Is it like to be like really 150% safe or something? Is it that you have maybe like different techniques, different approaches? So what is it maybe also, because that's essentially your work, what is taking longer to make this really like 100% accurate? What's, what, what, what is taking the time? Well, I mean, this is the first approved level three system, right? So it, it's kind of leading the way uh, with regards to offering this responsibility shift in the car, right? So this will be the first car, for example, in Germany with the R157 approval to allow the, the driver to be the fallback ready user and to engage in secondary activities. And the, the reason that's taken a while is, is getting the, the level of safety that's required when you're driving and the car is going to pay the bill for an accident, uh, right? They need to be really excellent and, and collision free. Uh, and the development of that takes a long time. So probably the reason is what, you know, what my CDO Marco Schaefer said this morning, that you do not have this extra insurance fund, that you do not need it. That's why probably um, he hired people like you to really be sure that doesn't happen, right? Not to pay individually, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you both said, like, when you don't fix this properly here in that vehicle, you're going to pay for this. <laughs> I already did a piece on the EQS, and I was driving that myself on a test track in Germany. It was also uh, pretty much fun. And of course, if you want to see more here of the S-Class, also driving you know, myself and exterior, interior, all the details about this vehicle, tune in here. Thanks for tuning.
tuning in and also thanks for the ride thank you